Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. During the next presentation, may I request your absolute silence? Well, I thought my razor was dull until I heard his speech. And that reminds me of a story that's so dirty, I'm ashamed to think of it myself. For I have a message of great importance for everyone in the audience. I implore you, send him back to his father and brothers who are waiting for him with open arms in the penitentiary. I suggest that we give him 10 years in Leavenworth or 11 years in Twelveworth. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll take five and ten in Woolworth. Now remember, please, absolute quiet. Cut the cards. The Marx Brothers, Gracho, Chico, and Harpo, were the biggest comedy stars of their time. Irreverent, anti-establishment, unpredictable, they made Depression-era America rock with laughter. And amazingly, their humor is as influential today as it was when they made their classic films. Those are the Marx Brothers we know and love, but there's a lot more to their story. It all began in 19th century Germany, where their maternal grandparents ran a traveling theatrical company. Levi Schoenberg was a bad magician. Fanny was a yodeling harpist. When they came to America, their daughter Minnie was 15. Seven years later, the bright, witty, and ambitious Minnie married Sam Marks. Frenchy, as everybody called him, was by most accounts a very nice man, a very good cook, but a very bad tailor. Frenchy and Minnie raised five boys, but what few know is that there was a sixth Marx brother. Chico was born after the firstborn died, and uh, his name was Manfred. Because Chico came after that, Minnie was very attached and adored him. Leonard was born in 1887. As a boy, Chico learned to hustle money in pool halls, race tracks, and bars. One quarter scotch, one quarter ice. Okay, lady, I sent him right over. Chico caused trouble from the time he was quite young. I mean, he got into gambling. He was a compulsive gambler by the time he was 12. Once while delivering a suit for his father, he lost a bet and the pants to a local hustler, so he stole Frenchie's shears and hawked them to get the pants back. His stage character, the lovable con artist, was already taking shape. It is very likely because whatever love Minnie was able to give was so directed at Chico that Chico was probably felt the most secure in himself because he's the one who wheeled and dealed jobs for them. Uh, and though probably he never cracked open a book, he was very articulate and delightful. She used to give him, you know, 50 cents a week to get piano lessons, and maybe he got to the piano teacher once out of four times, because he'd gamble the 50 cents away on, on the way to the teacher. Nobody ever had played the piano like him before, and nobody's ever played it like him since. It's quite an unusual technique that he developed all by himself, you know, he worked very hard at it, but only when he had to. The only time he ever practiced at all was when he had a show to do. He left us this remarkable legacy of how he played the piano, and people probably remember him more for his piano playing than anything else.
In 1888, Adolf was born. In the shadow of Chico's gregariousness, this child, who later changed his name to Arthur, and finally Harpo, became the good son. Every day he would come home from school, he'd go by the window and he'd see the man rolling the cigars. And as he rolled the cigars, he made this remarkably hideous looking face. He couldn't help it, it was just a reaction. The man would go, and the cigar would be made. And dad thought that was one of the best looking men he had ever seen in his life. He developed the gookie. As a result, it became a part of his act. Having mastered the look, Hoppo would pound on the window, do a gookie, and enrage the cigar maker. So began Hoppo's not totally innocent, challenging of authority figures. Hey, you're a wide guy, ain't you? Let go of that club. Give me that club, you hear? Did you see that badge? He taught himself how to play the harp. Uh, having no resources to go out and get lessons, he learned on the job as playing accompaniment for the brothers. And they incorporated the harp into the act. Daddy was a great ragtime pianist, and he had fun at the piano, but Harper was a really great musician, extraordinary harpist. In 1890, the famous trio was completed when Julius was born. Quiet and intellectually curious, he would frequently lock himself in the bathroom to read, stockpiling the lethal verbal arsenal that would be his trademark. Not that I care, but where is your husband? Why, he's dead. I'll bet he's just using that as an excuse. I was with him till the very end. <laughs> no wonder he passed away. I held him in my arms and kissed him. Oh, I see. Then it was murder. Will you marry me? Did he leave you any money? Answer the second question first. Even as a boy, Julius was careful with money. Many would give him five pennies to buy bread. He would get a day-old loaf for four cents and squirrel away the rest. Groucho would always equate money with security. The three Marx brothers became four in 1892 when Milton was born and five in 1901 when Herbert became the fifth Marx brother. Many's boys were raised in a poor immigrant neighborhood on the Upper East Side of New York at the turn of the century. Minnie's determination to see her son succeed was possibly reflective of feeling a failure in her own life and feeling that these boys had it. Driven by the ultimate stage mother, they would do anything to escape poverty. That willingness to do anything enabled them to survive the horrors of small-time vaudeville. The boys were doing so badly in school, they, except for Groucho, they were all playing hooky, that she decided to put them all into show business so they'd be in one place where she could keep an eye on them. <laughs> they started as a family singing act. First it was a three, then the four nightingales. That's Groucho looking just like Harpo with a gap-toothed smile. Many years later, Groucho remembered one of his first performances. And I walked out on the stage, and there were 60 musicians sitting out front dressed in evening clothes. I'd never seen anybody dressed in evening clothes except my father when he got married. But here were all... <laughs> here were these 60 men, and I was, I was really... I was stiff with fright, and, but uh, I bellowed this song out. I was young enough to have courage in those days. Anyhow, this is the way the chorus went. Of course, you must remember that I could sing then. <laughs> Somebody, sweetheart, I want to be. Somebody's heart beating all for me. Somebody's two arms around me when I feel blue. Somebody sweetheart, and that means you. That was it. For the Marx Brothers, there was no glamour in vaudeville. They toured the country singing in dilapidated theaters with only distant and unrealistic dreams of success to keep them going. The Feist Boy would sing, Way down by the sad seaside, and then Gamma would sing, Sat two lovers side by side. And Harpo would sing, first he sighed, and then she sighed, and then I'd sing. And then they both sighed, side by side, and then we'd sing, Peasy Weezy, what's his name? Peasy Weezy, Peasy Weezy, what's his name? Chico was uh, in the same town that his brothers were in, 
And when he saw that they were playing, he bribed the guy in the pit who played the piano to let him stand in for him. And when his brothers saw him in the pit, they started throwing things at him, and he threw them back, and he joined the act. A major breakthrough for the brothers occurred in 1910 in, of all places, Nagadoches, Texas. They would do a show and get on a train and move to the next town and do another show. What happened is as they were in the middle of their song, and not a very good song at that, a man runs in and says, runaway mule, runaway mule. And the audience raced out to see a runaway mule. So Groucho was just furious. Uh, when the audience finally filed back in, he made comments, comments like Nagadoshas. It was full of roaches. I think that was the kind of thing that they were saying. But the people thought it was funny. And then apparently Dad decided in a, on the spur of the moment to dive under a rug that was on the stage and go across the stage under the rug. And Chico ran over and started shooting the piano keys and they became a comedy act as a result of this. Now listen, you're making a big mistake. Well, These fellas are very clever. They're funny fellas. And I've got a play that I've written that I'd like to explain to you. Well, I'd, like to read, I'd like to read this manuscript for you. It's yeah, a wonderful play, and, play, and these fellas would fit in it. Now, now if you just come over and sit down with now. me for a minute, I'll explain yeah, the whole you're thing to his managers. Fun in High School featured Groucho as a stern professor, a role he would reprise 20 years later in Horse Feathers. Now then, baboons, what is a corpus on? That's easy. First as a captain, then as a lieutenant, then as a corpuscle. That's fine. Why don't you bore a hole in yourself and let the sap run out? The brothers were an onstage force, but it was an act of desperation by many that gave them the push they needed. In 1914, she had the audacity to buy a full-page ad in the trade magazine, Variety. She brazenly guaranteed that the Marx Brothers would boost the box office or perform for free. It worked. And from that point on, they were booked solid on the top vaudeville circuits. She took the name of Minnie Palmer, and she became an agent. And um, when Daddy joined the act, one of the things he discovered was that in order to sell some of her acts, she'd sell the Marx Brothers cheaper. So he, very gently, because he adored Minnie, but he managed to get the reins away and become the manager. And he stayed their manager until the very end. I'm sincerely proud to, to greet you and thank you very much for coming here. Uh, Chico, I, I've been a fan of yours, may I say this, since I was about this high mm -hmm. when I saw you in Duck Soup. Are you really brothers? Well, as far as I know. <laughs> you know, a lot of people ask me, uh, are we really brothers and can Harpo talk and how did you get your name? Is she going to make any more pictures? You know, Harpo can really talk. If you don't think he can talk, just play golf with him and let him miss a putt that big. You'll hear him talk. <laughs> How we got our names is a very interesting thing. One night, the Marx Brothers were involved in a backstage game of stud poker, and a comedian named Art Fisher was dealing. And he dealt a card to Leonard, and he stopped, and he said, wait a moment, you're always chasing the chicks, so... We're going to call you Chico. Chico's name came because uh, in those days, a fellow who chased girls was called a chicken chaser. I got my name when I was about 15 years of age. I, I used to chase the chickens. I still chase them. I don't catch them anymore. <laughs> and I'm just waiting for a rainy day. I'm good in the mud. <laughs> and a six he put down for Julius who he decided to call Groucho. We used to wear a little bag that was around the neck, was called a Grouch bag. In this bag, we would keep our pennies, our marbles, piece of candy. You wore a little Grouch bag around your neck with some money in it, and you never took it off when you slept, and you never took it off. And that was maybe part of the, the, the name Groucho. And I got my name from that cartoon strip. My own theory was that he really was going by his disposition. <laughs> That's mean. He wasn't always grouchy, but he was grouchy a lot. Well, Harpo got his name because, uh, obviously, he played the harp. When they were on the farm, Zeppo, who was about 14, was sitting on a fence when Daddy was walking down the road. And when he saw Daddy, he went, hi there, Zeke. And Dad said, hi there, Zepp. And it stuck. 
And Zeppo was born when the first Zeppelin came over to America. That's how he got his name. There was a freak, apparently, with Ringling Brothers Circus, and uh, the freak's name was Zippo. For some strange reason, the brothers des decided to call him Zippo, and he hated that. Uh, was, his name was Herbert, but he had uh, only that choice other, other than Zippo, so he changed it to Zeppo. And Gummo, oh, Gummo, Gummo wore uh, thick soled shoes, gum shoes, and they called him Gummo because of the shoes, because you could never hear him coming. It would be another 10 years before those nicknames became known to the public, but whatever you called them, the Marx Brothers finally made it to the top. In 1915, they played America's premier vaudeville theater, The Palace. New York audiences fell in love, and suddenly the Marx Brothers were earning over $1,500 a week. Although Groucho was the featured player, it was Harpo, according to Variety, who stole the show. Variety declared, he is a comedian who plays the harp and doesn't talk, getting laughs from his handling of both. Hey, what do you think you are? Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know who this is? No. He's South Frankfurters at the Mudge and the Wieners. Well, what do you want? My name is What Do You Care? My home is anywhere. People say I'm awful dumb, so I thought to you I'd come. Say, listen, what is it? Now, that? Now, just a moment. Wait a minute. He might be crazy. Wait, I'll find out. You want to go on the stage? Crazy. At one time in their vaudeville act, Harpo did speak. But their act, along with his speaking, was wearing real thin, and they were having trouble getting work. And finally, one day in Chicago, Minnie convinced a theater owner to book her boys with the promise that they'd have a brand new act. So Minnie got her brother, Al Sheehan, who was one of that famous vaudeville duo, Gallagher and Sheehan, and that was their uncle, to write the script for them that night. Unfortunately, in his haste, he forgot to write any lines in for my dad, who said, okay, I'll just ad lib. Well, they went ahead and they did the show, and then the following day the reviews came out and said something like, uh, last night's bill at the Orpheum, Arthur Marks proved himself a first-rate pantomimist. However, his reputation as a co comedian was rudely shattered every time he opened his mouth to speak. And from that time on, he never spoke another word on stage, just used the horn and the whistle. You know, I'd be lost without a telephone. I'm glad you see me. Step right in. Are you Mr. Lee? Kipper was always the Navy one. He says, look, we're better than half the shows that are on Broadway. And Hopper and I were always scared. We didn't think that we could make it. He was enormously uh, optimistic about everything. That was the gambler in him. And Groucho was always pessimistic. So that when Chico came up with the idea of doing a, a Broadway show, Groucho, Groucho was terrified. He said, why should anybody go see us on Broadway for $3.30, when for 55 cents they can see us in vaudeville? And Chico said, because we're too good for vaudeville. <laughs> he said, we belong on Broadway. A cartoonist friend of Chico's had an idea for a new production that would make use of leftover scenery being stored near a vacant theater in Philadelphia. Together, he and Chico combined existing Marx Brothers routines with new material, making it more of a review than a traditional stage musical. I'll Say She Is opened in Philadelphia in June of 1923 and was an instant hit. What do you think? I need a drink. All right. The only surviving evidence of their Broadway debut is a 1931 promotional film in which the brothers recreated the opening scene, demonstrating the verbal interplay that knocked out New York audiences. I want to speak to Mr. Lee. I'm a dramatic actor. So oh, I see. I'm Mr. Lee. Well, lend an ear to me. Can you play a role? Can I play a role? Do you know who you're looking at? No. Caesar's ghost. I play any kind of a role. You will? I'll eat it up like that. I played a part in Ben Ho once. What part did you play, sir? A girl. She played the part of Ben. And you? I played her. When you go out, take a slam at the door. You're kidding me, aren't you not? Kidding, you say. I've been here all day. Now show me what you've got. I wanted to play a dramatic part, the kind that touches a woman's heart to make her cry for me to die. Did you ever get hit with a coconut pie? There's my argument. Restrict immigration. 
I think I'll recite. Let it go, all right. Well, our first Broadway play was called I'll Say She Is. That was a current expression at that time. You know, you'd say a girl would walk down the street and you'd say, boy, she's good looking. And the fellow would say, I'll say she is. Get me a brick. Here's a brick. I always carry one for this invitation. Hey, I ought to lay this on your head. You can't do that. You don't belong to the Bricklayers Union. The Marx Brothers were now the toasts of Broadway. They were quoted in newspaper columns, invited to parties, featured on the radio, and offered membership in private clubs. One day, so the story goes, Harper was visiting some of his new friends on the set of a silent movie. A strange thing happened. He ended up in the picture. This recently unearthed footage, long thought lost by even the most ardent Marx Brothers fans, clearly demonstrates Harpo's engaging screen presence. Even though he had only a minor role, Harpo was able to inject a bit of the anarchic spirit that would later characterize his film persona. You sure you can't move? Hardly brilliant dialogue, but it is notable as the only time in his screen career that Harpo spoke on camera. Unfortunately, the movies weren't ready for his voice, technologically speaking. Broadway demanded more Mark's madness, and in December of 1925, their second smash, The Coconuts, opened. They were blessed with a musical written by Broadway legends George S. Kaufman and Irving Berlin. In the cast of that wild Florida farce was Margaret DeMont, the lady who had become Groucho's perennial foil, playing the grown-up opposite their childish antics. Years later, Groucho would proclaim she was practically the fifth Marx brother. Like all Marx Brothers shows, no one ever knew what to expect. For example, one night Harpo asked one of the chorus girls to run across the stage in the middle of Groucho's love scene with DeMont. The audience roared and the gag stayed. After Broadway, they took the coconuts on the road, touring until early 1928. But by the time they returned to the Great White Way for Animal Crackers, their third straight hit, show business had been revolutionized. With talking movies the latest rage, Paramount, like all studios, was desperate to sign performers who could move and speak at the same time. They snapped up the Marx Brothers. And what's more remarkable to me is that five years after their success on Broadway, they made their first motion pictures. So they got 25 years on stage before you ever see them in coconuts. And by that time, they were all 40 years old. In the spring of 1929, the Marxes made a talky version of the coconuts during the day and performed in the stage production of Animal Crackers at night. Their career couldn't be going any better. The success of the Marx Brothers was in part testament to their chemistry, on screen and off. The brothers would have normal sibling fights, just like any brothers, about various different uh, things, but they would always come back because the bond was so strong that they would have this wonderful feeling of forgiveness. There wasn't a day that went by that Daddy didn't call Groucho. They had never said anything. I mean, he'd call, he'd say, hi, Grouch, what's new? Grouch obviously would say nothing, and Daddy'd say, fine, bye. I mean, they did this every day, they touched base. Have you read any good books lately? Horse Feathers, the Marx Brothers' fourth film, became their fourth consecutive hit. It also put them on the cover of Time magazine. You might say they adapted to Hollywood success like Ducks to Soup.
fascism was on the rise in Europe and duck soup was filled with satirical jabs at bombastic dictators and their macho warmongering. It was probably the wildest of all their films and in retrospect, the one that most endeared them to the 60s anti-war generation. Nonetheless, it was not the hit Paramount expected. Just as laughs are the specialty of Harpo, Chico and Groucho Marx. Seen Roman in the famous forecourt of Groman's Chinese theater when the comedy clan gathered to be footprinted. So despite their immortalization in the cement outside Grammer's Chinese Theater, Paramount decided not to renew their contract. What few know is that in 1934, Harpo became the first American to perform in Russia since the revolution. He braved the brutal winter and tight government security to show the caviar circuit the real meaning of Marxism. In this rare film footage shot by a Russian cameraman, Harpo plays it straight for an obviously appreciative audience. When the Goodwill tour was over, the U.S. ambassador to Moscow enlisted Harpo as a diplomatic courier. He never did learn what secrets were in the envelope strapped to his leg. But in those days when the storm clouds of war were brewing, he was willing to risk his life to help his country. Those same dark clouds were hovering over the career of the brothers Marx, that is until Chico's gambling really paid off. Chico was a bridge partner with Irving Tilburg, and Chico said, you know, I, I don't think we're finished, and Irving said, you're not. He said, you've been handled wrong. Chico talked Thalberg, the savvy head of production at MGM, into offering the brothers an incredible deal. Chico came to his brothers and said, Thalberg's giving us a great contract. And Harper and Groucho said, we're not signing any contract. And Chico said, what do you mean? He said, we're not signing unless you let us manage your money. And so Chico had to give in. But money wasn't the key factor in this deal. Thalberg's eye was on creative excellence. The first thing he did was to reunite them with playwright George S. Kaufman. He said, I'm going to start a whole unit at MGM just for you, with your own writers and your own director. He said, and you'll wait and see. And of course, he was quite right. Before the cameras could crank a foot of film, the Marx Brothers began to worry about the script. So Thalberg suggested a road tour to test selected scenes. This inspired notion not only improved the script, but rebuilt the brothers' confidence by giving them the chance to do what they did best perform in front of live audiences. I used to see Groucho and the brothers on the stage of the Golden Gate Theater in San Francisco. They would come up and do scenes from their upcoming movie that they hadn't shot yet. I have never laughed like that in my life in the theater. Not ever. I mean, you, and, I, and I saw f four shows a day, seven days a week, and I screamed laughing all the time. They would do them in front of this live audience at the Golden Gate Theater and time the laughs so that when they shot the movie, they would, they would leave that much space for the audience to laugh at the movie so you could hear the next joke. As funny as they were in film, they were a hundred times, thousand times funnier on stage. And they were unpredictable. I mean, things would happen on stage that were so wonderful. And I used to watch them wallpaper Margaret Dumont into the wall, you know, four or five shows a day, this poor woman who looked like my mother. During the tour, the famous stateroom scene was almost dropped because it wasn't getting any laughs. Then one night, they threw out the script and Marxist anarchy ruled the stage once more. The results turned a weak scene into a cinema classic. On the second or third day, uh, I thought to myself, gee, the second show, there's nobody in the audience except a few drunks, guys in overcoats, and a few ladies of the evening. Um, I'll go and get my hair done. So I went out and came back and went backstage, and Daddy and Harper were waiting for me. And I said, hi. And they said, well? And I said, well? And they said, well? And I really didn't know what the hell they were talking about. I, Looked at Daddy and looked at Harpo, and Harpo said, I told you she wouldn't know. Chico said, I was sure you'd guess. I said, no what? Guess what? And it turned out they had changed parts. 
Daddy had played Harpo and Harpo had played Daddy and they did it for me and I wasn't there. That's one of the biggest disappointments I've ever had <laughs> in show business. It was a heartbreak because they never would do it again. The tour was a rising success and Thalberg's faith in the Marx Brothers was validated. A night at the opera was a box office smash and made them gigantic stars once again. Attempting to repeat the successful formula of a night at the opera, the Marx Brothers again hit the road to try out a new script. But two weeks after filming began, Thalberg, only 37 years old, died of pneumonia. Without his guidance during shooting and editing, the brothers had no strong creative vision. Still, Thalberg had set the course, and a day at the races would prove to be the Marx Brothers' last great movie. Oh, yes, yes. Just a moment. I have a most important announcement to make. Most important. The Marx Brothers are retiring from the silver screen. I, uh, we didn't know you cared. But since you do, we'll present to you songs and scenes from our quite farewell picture, The Big Star, where everything's a good time. Goodbye. <laughs> Racho, Chico, and Harpo were now in their 50s. Their last three films were mediocre at best, and MGM no longer wanted them. For that matter, neither did any other studio in town. The brothers, Chico aside, had no financial need to work, so they decided to retire. That's the fine. Let there be wine. And women. And the song. And women. And the caviar. And women. <laughs> The act was finished. Nothing would ever be the same. Not for the Marx Brothers, not for America. Pearl Harbor. The brunt of the cowardly blow struck at Pearl Harbor was borne by the Army and Navy. Harpo did his part for the war effort, crisscrossing the country, selling war bonds with stars such as Lucille Ball and Fred Astaire. I think I enjoyed Groucho the most when we did the Victory Caravan back in 1942 when we were selling bonds across the country in about 25, 26 cities. And uh, it was amazing. The train stopped in Washington, which was our first stop, and they had a tremendous crowd cheering everybody that got off the train. And when Groucho got off, nobody recognized him because he didn't have his mustache or cigar. So he just climbed down the other end of the car, put on his mustache, put the cigar in his mouth, got down on the crouch, got off, and got a tremendous hand. The atomic bomb ended the war and brought the troops back home. By the fall of 1945, it was time for all Americans to get back to a normal life. There were families to reunite, lives to rebuild. But could the Marx Brothers find a place in this brave new world? You bet your life. With the end of World War II came a new explosion of energy and optimism. America was getting back to work, and surprisingly, so were the Marx Brothers. Most people remember the Marxes from their movies. What few know is that they created a substantial body of work in television. That's a high-class carnival. You know Allegro Pizzicato? No, I don't. You know Jimmy Pizzicato? <laughs> Maybe you know Itsy Bitsy Pizzicato. None of the Pizzicato. Chico was the first right. to explore this uncharted territory, but it was Groucho who found everlasting stardom in the infant medium. We sat in the audience, and Bob Hope was reading a script, and he was reading it with Groucho. I'd never seen Groucho before in person. And uh, Bob dropped his script accidentally. So Groucho dropped his on purpose. And they talked for maybe 12 minutes or so, and very funny and not dirty. Groucho, what are you doing out here in the desert? Desert? I've been sitting in the dressing room for 40 minutes. <laughs> Groucho, excuse me a minute. I have to make an announcement on the air. Step into the studio with me, will you? All right, sir. You notice everybody in radio wears wooden shoes? <laughs> so after the show, I went up on the stage and I introduced myself to Groucho and said, um, how would you like to go uh, do a quiz show? And he said, well, I've flopped three times on the radio so far, and he had in variety shows. And uh, I'll, try, I'll compete with refrigerators. I'll do anything you want. He said, I would like to do a radio show, but I'll be damned if I do a, a quiz show. That's for idiots. 
Thank you, thank you. This is Groucho Marx. Well, here I am, stepping in over my head again. Folks, this is just as new to me as it is to you. I've never done one of these shows before, but we've got several couples up here on the stage, a lot of people in the seats out front, and the doors are locked, so I've got to go through with it. <laughs> Besides, somebody might win $1,000 cash at any moment. All I know is it can't be me. You Bet Your Life started on radio in October of 1947 with a format reminiscent of a dozen other quiz shows. But in its second season, it became the sleeper hit of the year and won for Groucho Radio's highest honor, the Peabody Award for Best Entertainer. He saw all his friends succeeding, Jack Benny and this and that, and, and he couldn't, and it really upset him. So when he finally did it himself, it, it made him extremely happy. This I know. The show switched from ABC to CBS just as television was on the way in. But could Groucho make the transition to TV? All right. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, the secret word tonight is name. N-A-M-E. Really? You bet your life. And here's that sterling Elgin American, the one, the only... What a ridiculous name. Oh, that's me, Groucho Marx. You're looking at the very first television pictures of Groucho Marx. This audition film was shot in December of 1949 and was never broadcast. We knew we had to be on television eventually, and we wondered how we were going to do that. Would we just televise a radio show? So they decided they'd, they'd bring a camera in and, and on, on CBS, and we did the, we did the, the show, and during the show, these guys uh, took some pictures of us on kinescope so we could look at it. Suppose I, suppose I kiss her and you didn't know anything about it. Oh, I'd know about it. <laughs> well, I guess I'm going to have to trap you. Um, Howard, I'll bet you a buck. I'll bet you a buck I can kiss your wife and you won't know a thing about it. Bet? Okay, it's a bet. Okay. Would you mind moving aside there? <laughs> Just a moment. You saw me kiss her, didn't you? That's right. I lose. Here's your buck, huh? Oh, that isn't my wife. Well, don't come running to me with your troubles. I... Are, you, are you married? Yes, I am. You have any kids? Three and I think four pretty soon. When were you home last? Huh? How'd you lose your job? Well, I was teaching someone how to drive, and I got a ticket for giving the wrong signal. We had quite a talk uh, when we went on television as to whether he should have the little black mustache and the whole thing, you know, like in the movies. And Weezy says, no, you're a different man now. You are not the continuation of that fella. The geniuses at the networks wanted him to do the show with that mustache painted on him and the eyebrows, and he refused. Groucho Marx. And you bet your life. And now, here he is, the one, the only... Is that boy still hanging around? Oh, that's me. <laughs> Don't even say the secret way. The duck will come down and pay him $100. The word tonight is Pepe. That's the way you pronounce it in French. Oh. Pepe. Bob Dwan, who later became the director of the Groucho Show and had been my boss in San Francisco, said, I didn't know you were in town, George. I'm doing an audition, and I'd like you to come down. I, this show may never make it. It's with Groucho. We didn't know there was going to be any great chemistry. I mean, we didn't be able to think, oh, boy, there's a guy that's going to have the chemistry with Groucho. You may fire and run. Uh, you have to ask me. OK, uh, uh, what do you want me to say? Go ahead. Go ahead, George. <laughs> That's some ad lib, eh? <laughs> but you see, he's so dignified and straight. It's just right for Groucho. And he went to college, and, and uh, Groucho didn't. And it, it was a great luck. That's what it was. All right, uh, are you ready? <laughs> oh, 
we did a, a routine that I didn't, I didn't realize I was doing. I was ad-libbing, but, but in terror. I've been getting a lot of mail recently from people saying that uh, I don't like you and that I ride you on the show and everything. And you know that isn't true, George. You know I love you. <laughs> I didn't know that much, no, huh? No, no. <laughs> if you were a woman, I'd, I'd have snapped you up long ago. <laughs> I just want you to know that. George. Well, I knew that. Um, yes. You did know it, huh? Yes. I, oh. mean, I knew you liked me, oh. uh, in your own way. Uh... <laughs> oh, how that man could embarrass me. And uh, it wasn't that he was really mean, but he could see the dark side of everything, you know. And he would get a lot of fun out of insults. He said to me more than once, was, I, Bob, I have nothing but confidence in you and very little of that. I think one of the reasons he was kind of mean is that he had tight shoes and he had insomnia and he had stomach problems all the time. He couldn't sleep at night, you know. He had a heck of a time. And it made him just kind of ornery. His friend Goodman Ace had, I think, the best retort. He said it was, uh, there was a lot of action in the show, he said. Groucho opened his mouth and literate, witty words came out. Who was the barbarian conqueror known as the Scourge of God? Scourge of God. S-C-O-S-C-O-U-R-G-E. Scourge. 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 Scourge of God. It's the difference. They don't know what any of they don't know it, and I can't pronounce it. <laughs> it's a real classy quiz show we have. We did extensive uh, searching for contestants. We, we found them uh, through uh, newspaper stories, through letters that were written to us. It was a very popular show, and people wanted to be on it. No, I don't think the people were intimidated by Groucho. Uh, they were proud to be on. The ones I felt sorry for were the contestants who thought they were funnier than Groucho, who wanted to do jokes with Groucho. <laughs> and you could see it happening, you know, it just, he'd let him, he'd, he'd, he'd let him go and then, well, oh. <laughs> there, there was actually a little sprinkling of rudeness to what he said, but he was the silly man saying it. What makes you think just because a man is five inches uh, taller than six feet that this makes him a, a man? Well, you know, uh, it doesn't go by size. A man's size has nothing to do with his ability in any way. I'm trying to keep this on a very <laughs> euphemistic plane. Well, name one specifically. Well, uh, automobiles couldn't run without felt. Aeroplanes couldn't run. Uh, the girls in California have that new look by this... You uh, mean the girls couldn't run without felt? <laughs> well, a lot of them have felt and then run. <laughs> The question is, did Gotcha have a script or did he ad lib? And the answer is yes. I don't know why, but people try to prove that our show was scripted. Well, if you if you ever worked with amateurs, um, you know that you don't give them a script that the night of a show, and they're going to remember. What you want them to remember is when he asks you how you met your husband, tell him that story that you told me. Well, then naturally Groucho will know what that story is going to be. And he's got some ideas of what he's going to say, but it's not a script. The critics raved. Radio TV Daily said, There isn't a comedian in the business that can hold a candle to Brother Groucho's repartee. And therein lies the treat of this new video fair. Only now, upon viewing these recently discovered behind-the-scenes photographs, does it become clear that Groucho had a little help. We're on film, and, and sometimes Groucho would get off on a tangent that we knew we wouldn't ever use on the show. And we're eating up this film, this 35 millimeter film. So but they figured they had to have some way to get a message to him out on the stage. And so what we got, I remembered, was I'd seen him in bowling alleys, you know, that, and which is essentially an overhead projector, which you find in every classroom nowadays. So there was nothing very mysterious about it. It had this white glass with the light behind it, so you could see it. And he, the silhouette, you'd see the words. And he could write backwards, and it says, jump to page seven, or ask her where she met her husband, you know, and he would write down this. And, and Groucho, if he looked, he would see, and then he'd ask where she met her husband. And that moved the show along. Well, in what way is your husband romantic, assuming that he is? Which I question. Oh, man, have you ever been made love to by a Frenchman? <laughs> Oh, 
Not, not that I can recall. <laughs> Oh, take them out and pass them around. <laughs> you went to college for that, huh? Keep it this way now, nice and quiet and subdued, huh? All right. <laughs> UCLA, 53. It took 45 minutes to film each episode of You Bet Your Life, after which they would be trimmed down to the best 24 minutes for broadcast. Most of the material that was left on the cutting room floor belonged there. But every so often, a special moment was saved on the editor's outtake reel. You're 30 years old, John? I'm 50. No, what? You what? I'm 50. You're thirsty? Well, I... about the contestants when they came up there and we prepared a lot of material for him but he was totally free to use that in any way he wanted and so he could take chances what have you learned after being 25 years in politics well the old-fashioned way is still the best <laughs> I must have some reputation, you know. <laughs> there isn't anything anybody can say to me anymore that doesn't evoke some kind of a dirty laugh from the audience. <laughs> what do you mean by the old-fashioned way? <laughs> well, just... And if they didn't work, he knew they would be cut out. He'd turn around to me and say, Clip, 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 here we go again. <laughs> it was gone. Well, now, suppose you became a famous actress and then you met somebody you liked and got married. Would you be willing to quit acting and be a housewife and a mother? Well, I think if you keep your feet on the ground, you can combine both. That's what I would like to do. Well, if you keep your feet on the ground, you'll never be a mother. <laughs> a waste of film. <laughs> Primarily, the big objective, uh, Groucho, will be to uh, migrate the people by space vehicle to other planets that have more desirable temperatures. You're going to have to put your shoes on again, you know. <laughs> it is getting deep, ain't it? Yeah. <laughs> Pardon me just a minute. I hate to interrupt this, but uh, have you read this book? No, sir. Well, hold it. I'll be right back. <laughs> Now that we've all seen action, let's have a little action on the show. Here. Before we go on, may I uh, make an announcement here? Well, you may. I don't approve of it. You can go ahead and make it. Well, this it. is a, a serious announcement for a doctor in our audience. Uh, there's nothing wrong with anybody here at the show. Uh, yeah, hell there is. <laughs> um, Dr. Hoyt, uh, uh, one Dr. of the patients... Dr. Hoyt, that's a fine name for a doctor, Dr. Has, Hoyt. Has a call for you, sir. Doctor, why don't you pay your bills and they won't be <laughs> badgering you in the middle of a performance. Huh? Oh, you're terrible. Yes, sir. <laughs> and not only terrible, but revolting. <laughs> welcome, welcome to the DeSoto Plymouth Dealers. <laughs> Say, your face looks familiar. Haven't we met before? I don't think so, Groucho. <laughs> and uh, what is your name, miss? No, this is the lady. Oh, I see. <laughs> Either I'll have to get my glasses fixed, or you'll have to do your hair differently. <laughs> what is your name, sir? Uh, Forsythe. Ronald Forsythe. Ronald, huh? It was Rodney during rehearsal. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay, now I think we better get started and play You Bet Your Life. Where's the duck? The, the duck? <laughs> Well, Bradshaw, in the words of Rufus T. Firefly, wasn't a sentimental old fluff, but this kinescope of his appearance on the Jack Benny program was among his most prized possessions. It hasn't been seen since the original broadcast in 1955. Say the sacred word, which is something found around the house. The duck will come down and pay you $100. Something around the house? Yes. Now, where do you live, uh, Rod? Well, right now, I'm living in Glendale. Glendale. Right? Yes, I have a little home there with six rooms and and windows and window shades and uh, Venetian blinds and tables and chairs and spoons and saucers and dishes and rugs and uh, <laughs> knives and forks. Hold it, hold it. Why are you telling me all this? Well, you said that the secret word is something around the house. <laughs> I can't get over how familiar you look. <laughs> you play a Stradivarius? A stra oh, no, no. You see, I, 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 you have to be rich to be able to have a Stradivarius. See, I'm poor. I, all I have around my house are towels and rugs <laughs> and, and uh, ashtrays. <laughs> Look, enough of that already. Now, Rodney, you say you, you don't have a Stradivarius? No, sir. You know, I heard that a lot of imitation Strads have been made and sold. I know, but they could never fool me because, you see, I, I could tell a phony. been a mistake. The duck thought you said the secret way, but you didn't. What? Secret way is telephone, and you said telephony. Yeah, but I got an impediment in my speech. I always say that. I say telephony. I say yes, telephony. When I shave, I use, I use cologne. I say it all the time. You use cologne when yes. you shave? Yes. Well, in the sentence you use, you said you wouldn't be fooled because you could telephony. Well, you didn't let me finish the sentence. I said, I was going to telephony a friend of mine who's a violin expert. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> What's his name, this friend? <laughs> his name got a friend. Well, okay, they say the customer's all right, but I don't know how that applies to you. You sound like the type who's never been a customer. I don't care. Just let me at this duck. There must be more where that came from. Well, there was, but he just flew in from Las Vegas. Benny is not... Although he's a funny ad liber, he does it with attitude. I mean, he does it with a facial expression and gets, you know, tremendous laughs. The big question tonight is $3,000. <laughs> now, you have 15 seconds to decide. <laughs> you have 15 seconds to decide on a single answer between you. Think carefully and please don't help in the audience. Are you ready? Yes. Yeah. All right, there's a famous radio and television comedian who was born in Waukegan, Illinois. Jack Benny! Jack Benny! Jack Benny! Jack Benny! I got him! Jack Benny! Jack Benny! I know it! Jack Benny! Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We know it's Jack Benny, Mr. Forsythe, but that's not the question. What? The question is this. Now listen. This is the question. For many years, this bum has been lying about his age. Now, for $3,000... <laughs> $3,000, can you tell me how old he really is? <laughs> Only got five seconds more. $3,000, what is Jack Benny's real age? 39. I'm sorry, but that's the wrong answer, which means the big question next week will be worth $3,500. Thanks and good luck in the DeSoto Plymouth Day. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye, Rodney. <laughs> so anybody that can give away as much money as you do and still tell jokes deserves something. <laughs> Jack, that's an unfortunate subject, you, but since you did bring it up, uh, yeah. when do I get paid? How about money? Oh, 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 well, Groucho, I wouldn't worry about that because you will get a check tomorrow morning. Mm. Now, how about paying me in cash? 
<laughs> Why, what's what's wrong with my check? Well, I can telephone you too. Good night. <laughs> You bet your life ended this remarkable run in 1961. The real secret word was spontaneity. That's what made the show unique. You never knew what Groucho would say next. That edge gave the program life in syndication, where it has influenced each new generation of comedians. The program revived Groucho's career and made him a bigger star than ever, and paved the way for a Marx Brothers renaissance. On that, you can bet your life. Back in 1946, just before Groucho fell into his newfound stardom, he was enjoying semi-retirement. He was a frustrated farmer, and he was constantly out in the backyard pruning the trees and tending to the, the vegetable gardens. He loved doing that. Here in these never-before-seen 3D home movies, Groucho relaxes with his family. Harpo, no longer the jaunty world-traveling member of the Algonquin Roundtable, had retired to more sedate pleasures. While Groucho was busy revolutionizing the quiz show, Chico took his act overseas. Chico, what do you think of England? Oh, I like England very much. I hope England's going to like me. Tell me something. Do you talk like that all the time? No, I talk like this in the pictures. You see, I used to be, uh, in the war, I used to be always Italian, but I saw what they did to Mussolini, so now I'm Greek. Excuse me. <laughs> Harpo, meanwhile, pursued his diverse interests, including posing for Hollywood's favorite portrait artist, John Decker. In these rare home movies, he's seen clowning in front of Decker's Harpo as the Blue Boy. My father would sometimes be listening to the radio, and they had a show in Palm Springs where people would come on about lost animals, lost pets, that they had found animals. And my father would generally answer the, the radio ad and bring that animal home. And we were always, the house was always filled with animals. He loved animals. As much as Harpo enjoyed spending time with his family, he wasn't ready to retire, not yet. Somebody out of the audience would start shooting back at us. You know that. I believe that my dad was apprehensive every time he walked out on the stage. Oh, you want me to do a different type show? Is that it? Huh? Well, maybe I better humor this kid. Let's walk on back into my office. Will you come back here, huh? Come on back. Here we are. Well, you like that, huh? <laughs> He was very nervous that night because in those days it was live television and you only had one shot at it. This was no editing. And he recognized that. And this was not rehearsed heavily to the point where it would be smooth. And he knew that. A windshield wiper. <laughs> Yeah, more, oh, more, this is great. A windshield wiper on a rainy day. <laughs> Nobody ever knew how to write for Harpo. He went to page two, and it says Harpo skips down a nice little road, and he is confronted by a huge stuffed bear. Harpo does something funny. That's how they wrote for him. Come on, I asked you to play the hop. Will you play the hop? You won't play the harp? You don't want it? Why? Mm. Want to play another instrument? <laughs> this, <laughs> this is yours? Yours? You, you invented this? Oh, good. It's very peculiar. Fine. It's got two mouthpieces, huh? You play in both sides at the same time? <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> now, listen, would you please do me a favor? And I'd like you to play the harp. Would you play the harp? You don't want to play the harp? You have another instrument to play? Oh, sure. I'll wait. I'll wait. What are you going to get? Oh, you're going to get the clarinet. I didn't know he played. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to watch Harpo play the clarinet. He's really one of the greatest. 
<laughs> you gonna play the clarinet? Not seriously. What are you gonna play? What are you gonna play? I'm forever blowing bubbles. That's why. You, you're gonna play it seriously? Well, if you're gonna play it seriously, I'll direct the band seriously, because I'm a great musical conductor. <laughs> Are you going to play the number on the... Now stop it! Finish the number, will you, Harpo, please? trouble what's the trouble don't you want me to play don't you want me to direct it you want another director who do you want who do you want I would oh Billy May Billy May <laughs> Billy May all right Billy would you come over here please I want you to meet Hoppo Mox oh, uh, have Harpo. you got a suggestion can you help us can you help us yes I have a great suggestion Milton what he plays yeah I direct yeah. and you sing I thought you'd never call on me I'm a great singer I'm a sensational singer <laughs> I'm forever blowing bubbles, pretty bubbles in the air. Oh, they make me so high. They make you really motor to dig this And just like my dreams, they fade and I'll take it now. You always felt that the roles outside of Harpo were the most difficult to play. In another dramatic role, some dandies, huh? I'm not trying to run. Well, look, I didn't take any course in mind reading at the police academy. Let's go, huh? Come on. Hey, wait a minute. For Pete's sake, what do you want? Except for those occasional guest spots, Harpo spent his time in Palm Springs playing golf and being a good father and husband. So, to make it simplified, we moved down here. Minnie, what, what do you like most about living in Palm Springs? Well, I love horseback riding, and in Beverly Hills, you couldn't do much horseback riding. So I, have, I do have a horse of my own. I can remember my father coming and waking me up in the middle of the night very often because he wanted to play a game. He wanted to play jacks. Uh, he wanted to play cards, any kind of a game. But if he was working during the daytime, nighttime was the only time he had to spend with his children. And it would never occur to him to let us sleep. He would just come wake us up, and that was his time to play a game or whatever. My parents were having a lot of problems. My mother was uh, drinking, and, and off. And this Carpo and his family lived six or seven blocks away when I was growing up in Beverly Hills. And many the evening that I would bicycle over to Harpo's house, there was a peacefulness there that there was not in my house, and I would always bicycle over in time for, for them to invite me to dinner and hope that they would, and they frequently did. They, mo they always did. Joe, you know uh, that gypsy love song? Well, I know the chorus. Well, I played the voice. Maybe you could follow me, huh? Well, suppose you play the verse while I noodle around. You're going to noodle? Uh-huh. What do you mean by noodle? <laughs> oh, that's fine. You noodle there, and I'll macaroni over here. <laughs> That's a good. 
Now we try the chorus, but the chorus we play pianissimo. Uh, you know what pianissimo is, Joe? Oh, my. How long do you study music? Oh, about 15 years. You know, two more years you could have been a plumber? <laughs> this is my family album. And this is my brother Harpo. He's always chasing the girls. But no more, now he's a teller the girls about creamy prom. Because prom home permanent is a waving cream. Leaves your hair soft. You get a creamy prom. Right, Harpo? He was a combination of a will-o'-the-wisp and Peter Pan. And to a little girl, he was magic. <laughs> Appearance on British television. <laughs> um, can I ask the obvious question? You're going to play the piano for us, aren't you? Yes, but uh, I'm a little busy right now. Busy? Backstage. What do you mean, backstage? <laughs> no. What, here? Yeah. Can you get one for me? I got it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> when my Uncle Chico would sit with me at the piano, sometimes he would help me on the pieces that I was supposed to be playing because my mother was always sitting and listening from the other room. But he would always entertain me because he had a style all his own. I was more entertained uh, by his piano playing than what I was supposed to be doing. We would be driving up any street, and he'd say, you see the green light, baby? And I'd say, yes. He said, Daddy bets you that it'll turn red before you can count 10. <laughs> they had to have a bet going on everything. Hey, you don't look like an angel. Disguise yourself. No, no. Put on your halo. 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 Not the hello. Your halo. You watch. You're looking at the Deputy Seraph, a television pilot about muddling angels writing earthbound wrongs. These scenes, pieced together from the recently discovered master film footage, are all that remain of the legendary, lost, Marx Brothers TV show. Did you ever see a worse-looking pair of angels? Say the secret word, you can have either one of them. 24 Chicago, take one. Baker, take three. Hey, pipe it down. Here comes the chief. One. Hey. Action. It's uh, easy. Now, don't be scared. All you got to do is a sneak in the side of this a sneaky fellow. Now, go ahead. Now, do your stuff. A fine pair of bunglers, a jealous woman. <laughs> She'll get even with him. She'll marry him. I'll have to take charge here. Phone, please. Hmm. I wonder how they do that. Hello? Okay. Three. Take four. Take four. You mean the phone treatment on the dialect now. It really punches. Go. He's a piano player. I'm a piano player. I fix him. Start again and say, look. <laughs> oh. Look. He's a piano player. I'm a piano player. I fix a him. Freeze! Go into action. Where is he going? Where is he? That's good. <laughs> Step out. Walk. Phone, please. Hmm. I must find out how they do that. Roger. Chico. I'll take the easy way. Phone, please. Extraordinary. Two. It was the first time all three brothers had worked together in nearly a decade, but it wasn't a happy experience. Throughout the filming, Chico frustrated everyone with his inability to remember lines. Then, during a break in shooting, it was discovered that he was suffering from hardening of the arteries. No insurance company would underwrite the rigorous schedule of a weekly series, so production was shut down, and the deputy seraph, 
was never completed. Hey! And he was beginning to get very ill at that time. And it was hard from then on. Despite his illness, Chico kept working. He starred in Summer Stock and with Harpo, entertained Las Vegas audiences with a nightclub act. I had uh, just split from my husband and was having a hard time financially. And uh, I was talking to Daddy about it. And he said, gee, he said, I wish I were Groucho so I could help you. And I said, and I'm so glad I said it. I said, I wouldn't trade you in for any of my uncles. I said, you're the best in the world. I've been always so happy that I said that to him. Anyway, he was getting sicker and sicker. and We knew it was only a matter of time. And he had a near, near brush. I mean, my mother had me fly out because we thought he was dying. And, but he recovered from that attack. Well, they'd lived through so many near deaths with Daddy that I think when he finally died, they just were sort of relieved because he was very, very ill. So when that happens, it's kind of a relief. Jimmy Durante at the funeral looked awful. And I heard him say, it's the end of it. There'll be no more Marx Brothers. Well, now, Harpo speaks in this fascinating new autobiography, that is. In, in person, that's another question. Let's find out. Harpo, uh, your book is chock full of great and very funny stories. Now, which one is your favorite? and Gummo saw what was going on, they started whooping, too. We heaved... <laughs> we heaved everything we could get our hands on into the office pit. <laughs> the piano player surrendered. <laughs> I think it was the Stonewall Jackson. <laughs> I don't remember much about the rest of the performance. <laughs> it can't be that cold in here. <laughs> he loved music, and he played the harp every single day of his life. And the, probably the most important moment of his stage life would always come when he would sit down to play solo harp. And that's when you saw Harpo transform himself into the serious Arthur Marx. And all of a sudden, he would be at, at one with the harp. In the late 30s, Salvador Dali, the great surrealist painter, dubbed the Marx Brothers as being the great surrealist act. He gave my dad a harp that had strings of barbed wire and it was wrapped in cellophane and there were spoons and knives and forks glued to the entire frame. During one of my dad's many semi-retirements, Gummo came to him with a deal. It was to do four one-minute commercials for Labatt's beer. Harpo, what would you like most in all the world right now? No, not that, not that. Imagine it's hot. The sun's beating down on you. Imagine you're in the middle of a burning desert, a hundred miles from the nearest oasis. You haven't had a drink of water in three days. Now, what do you want most in all the world? Harpo, didn't anyone tell you this is a beer commercial? That's right, you've got it. Labatt's Pilsner Lager Beer. They were the most surrealistic commercials I've ever seen in my life. Harpo. Imagine we're lost, drifting in the middle of the Pacific, surrounded by man-eating sharks. No food, no water, no hope. Then suddenly we sight land. We're rescued. 
saved from a fate worse than death. Now, what's the first thing you'd ask for? My dad jumped at it because uh, he was able to make some money and it would be just one day of shooting. Round one, you moved into the center of the ring. You sized him up. Then you hit him. You changed your tactics. You're trying to confuse him. You're laughing at him, trying to make him mad. What happened? Ooh, don't tell me. He got mad. Never mind, Harpo. You'll do better in the next round. And ne to this day, I don't understand him, but I find him most fascinating. I'm not sure my father really wanted to retire. Show business had been his life, and I think that's what he wanted to continue doing until he couldn't do it any longer. The entire Marx clan gathered for Harpo's final performance. He shared the bill with Red Hot comedy folk singer Alan Sherman. Just about the end of the first half of the show, Alan stepped to the microphone and said, this is a very special evening because you folks are going to witness the retirement of Harpo Marx. And all of us went, oh, you know, when we heard that shocking news. And then Alan said something like, I don't even know if he'll come out, but I'm going to ask this great gentleman and great comedian if he will come out and let us applaud him once more, something to that effect. Well, Harpo came out and he got a standing ovation again, first of all, because we did love him, and secondly, we thought we'll never see him again. And then remember, Dad got up and made a speech for the first time, spoke in public. It was a very interesting feeling because here is a man who was silent all his life and making people laugh, and now he was speaking and everybody was silent. And then a, a chuckle originally built to a roar of laughter over the next six or seven minutes because once he started to speak, you couldn't shut him up. <laughs> Here is Hoppo really at work. And now, here is my special guest star, Rufus T. Firefly, J. Cleaver Lupo, Dr. Hugo Z. Heckenbush, Captain Jeffrey Spaulding, also known as Mr. Groucho Marx, ladies and gentlemen. In 1973, when he was almost 83, Groucho made his last great variety show appearance. Proving that the master's wit was as sharp as ever, Groucho traded quips with one of comedy's biggest stars. How are you, Doctor? Uh, fine. Nice fine. to see you. Yeah. You look for... Uh, have, have a sit down. Oh, I'll be glad to. How have you been? I've just been fine. Well, what are we going to do now? I don't know, but I'm just tickled to have you here, and words cannot express how thrilled I am to have you on the show. A little money wouldn't hurt either. <laughs> All right. Now. You smoke cigars, I see, huh? Yeah. I like them. Good ones? Yeah, well, it, well, it just mostly comes from the first time I saw you, and I figured, gee whiz, you know, I would like to smoke cigars. Well, uh, you know, it's, it's a handy thing to have for a comedian. Assuming you are a comedian. <laughs> Maybe there's, there's one question I wanted to ask you. You've known all of the truly great names in comedy. Now, I mean, how would you classify me? You? Yeah. You'd come right after Nixon. <laughs> you, 
And so would I if I had a chance. <laughs> Every one of those jokes in that session worked uh, uh, because he would, uh, he would listen to the question and then that mind would click in. Okay, how would you rate W.C. Fields? I never speak ill of the dead, <laughs> except in your case. When I met Groucho, I found exactly what I expected, a cantankerous, ornery, salty, amusing, amazing man who took nothing seriously. Do you believe in life after death? I have serious doubts about the life before death. <laughs> the way we're going now. <laughs> I believe in death during life, and so does everyone watching this show. Do you have any unfulfilled wish? Well, yes, I'd like to terminate this interview as soon as possible. Well, you can't be funnier than that. And of course, it put Cosby down and put Cosby away because uh, everybody had great respect for Cosby at that point, except for Groucho, who had none. And he didn't, he didn't respect Bill. He bo it bothered uh, Groucho that Bill smoked better cigars than, than Groucho did. So Groucho, on the way out, copped about a half a dozen of Bill's cigars. <laughs> And, and I, you just, you had to love him. In 1974, Groucho was presented with an honorary Oscar for his contribution to film. He began this final moment in the spotlight by taking a bow for all the Marx Brothers. Hello, I must be going. I cannot stay, I came to say I must be going. I'm glad I came, but just the same, I must be going. I'll stay a week or two, I'll stay the summer through, but I am telling you, I must be alone. Hooray for Captain Spaulding, the African explorer. Did someone call me Schnorrer? Hooray, hooray, hooray. He went into the jungle and Much has been said and written about the style and substance of the Marx Brothers comedy. Film historians have offered endless intellectual analyses as to the reasons for their success. But perhaps the most persuasive argument for why they've made audiences laugh for four generations is that they were funny, pure, and simple. Fooled you that time, didn't I? Like all great artists, Groucho, Chico, and Harpo were true originals. And once the Marx Brothers entered our collective consciousness, they never left. And now, once again, I'd like to bring out my guest, just for a while, Groucho Good thing you got friends to City Hall. Go like that, see? And I go like that. <laughs> Come on. Look right into there. Go ahead. Take it easy now. <laughs> Schnitzelbank. Ja, das ist ein Schnitzelbank. Hier ist das nicht ein Kutzenlang. Ja, das ist ein Kutzenlang. Kutzenlang, Schnitzelbank. I do schönes, oh, du schönes, oh, du schön